Okay, so uh, on today's program, we have a special speaker um, who has been a volunteer with the Historical Society for two years, three years, and worked uh, very heavily on researching our walking, um, our house walk this year, our Tales Our Houses Tell, which was earlier this month in Southwest Oak Park. So uh, one of the topics that we didn't really get a chance to talk about on the walking tour um, is one that our speaker will be answering today. So um, I, without further delay, will introduce Frank Fiorito and we are going to switch spots. So. Okay. All right, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Frank Fiorito and uh, I'm looking forward to sharing uh, the uh, research that I did on uh, today's uh, Ask the Historian question, which is, why are the lots on Home Avenue between Madison Street and Harrison different from those in the surrounding area? And what you're seeing right now is a picture of the west side of Home Avenue. And we'll be contrasting that with the east side of Home Avenue. Um, and what we're looking at while we're on this slide, uh, what we see in Oak Park today is the vision of many different real estate developers who acquired land and then subdivided it to suit their target customers and maximize their profit. The size of the lot varied with the type of housing propo proposed for the specific uh, piece of land. In Oak Park, most of the uh, homes are oriented facing the street, just like in this picture. Most lots are rectangular, with the frontage being shorter dimension of the rectangle. The depth of the lot is usually greater than the width. So this next slide, looking north uh, up Home Avenue and at the east side of the street, the even number of addresses. The lots on Home Avenue south of Madison differ in that the rectangle is turned so that the longer dimension is that facing the street. And let's see here, just to illustrate that with the court, well, I guess it's not gonna work, I thought the, oh, there yeah. you go. And you can see this would be considered the frontage uh, typically, uh, and the houses are turned uh, to um, uh, 90 degrees, I guess that would, you would call that. So um, how did this happen? Uh, to answer this question, one has to go back to the events of 1904 when real estate developer uh, Thomas uh, H. Hulbler acquired one of Oak Park's last undeveloped parcels for his new subdivision. And here's a picture of a map from 1894 showing this vast piece of property that the bulk of which was acquired by Hulbler. Though the vacant land Hulbert sought appeared to be one vast undeveloped lot, it was not under single ownership. The parcel he was able to acquire stretched from Madison Street south uh, to Harrison and ran from a point 35 feet east, I put my arrow there, uh, of Home Avenue to 72 feet west of Carpenter. Um, on Carpenter, already owned by others, the 72 feet deep lots um, had already been subdivided to allow a shallow but conventionally oriented rectangle lot facing the street. There's Carpenter right here. On its own, a 30 foot uh, strip of property along Home Avenue was too shallow for building houses. It was, however, very good for spoiling Holbert's plan. Go here. The owner, a man from outside of the area, one Mr. Lochran, didn't appear to have any plans for the property, but was interested in selling it to Holbert for $8,000 firm. He had purchased the property as an investment and it was time to cash in. And here we can see on this slide, uh, the layout, Lockwin's 35 feet, 
the 150 feet that Hulbert intended for uh, lots on Clinton, and then the 28 feet that Hulbert owned, just shy those 35 feet of Home Avenue. Mm -hmm. Now, having paid $60,000 for 45 acres of land that would yield 150 foot deep lots for close to 200 houses, Hulbert saw Lochran's $8,000 35-foot strip as a blatant attempt to take unfair advantage of the situation. Lochran repeatedly denied any dark motives to his purchase of the land, but today we can come to our own conclusions as to what motivated him to buy a one-half-mile strip of land only 35 feet wide. Negotiations between the two came to a halt. Albert decided to draw up his plat of subdivision without addressing the 35 foot strip. The village board liked the idea of a new subdivision, but the trustees were greatly troubled by what might become of this narrow strip. Rumors began to circulate that it might be purchased by the Metropolitan Elevated Railroad for use as a right of way. The board, instructed Hulbert to include the strip in his proposal for subdivision. In other words, either pay Mr. Lochran or forget your plans. Though having presented Hulbert with a dilemma, in, in November of 1904, the board gave him approval to begin making investments to develop the land at his own expense and subject to the approval of the Commissioner of Public Works. Holbert proceeded with the work on the infrastructure for the development, and it was indeed at his own expense. So enter a real estate broker, Frank, or F.E. Ballard, as he typically went by. Ballard negotiated an option to purchase the problematic strip of land at the seller's asking price, and agreed on a plan to combine his holdings with Holbert in order to subdivide the land into more desirable lots. Once the village approved their plats, Ballard would exercise the option and acquire the land. Now, this is looking at the 700 block of Clinton and with those 150 foot lots that Holbert uh, was planning to develop. And so they were, would be facing Clinton here and this would be the entire piece of property going back. Now, with Ballard acquiring the 35-foot uh, strip and adding to what Hulbert already owned, um, the Hulbert control land would go all the way to Home Avenue. So Hulbert had standardized his lots on Kenilworth and at, on Clinton at a depth of 150 feet. Extending from the back of Clinton, his land continued for the next 28 feet, and then combined with Ballard's option, this would give him a total of 63 feet. A lot of numbers here in this, but that's where the uh, diagram comes in. To provide, um, oh, there was still a problem though, um, as far as building a, a potential 63 foot deep lot, the um, requirement was for 16 feet to have an alley, and uh, that was necessary to factor in. Um, to provide 16 feet for use of an alley, Ballard and Hubbard uh, proposed lots along the east side of home, over here, uh, to be sized at a depth of 47 feet, but they would have frontage, and I have not written that dimension in there, of 75 feet. Um, the problem seemed solved. The land could be developing, uh, developed by reducing the size and changing the orientation of the lots. The next step was to submit the plat for village board approval. The October 7, 1905 Oak Leaves celebrated the proposed solution with the headline, Danger Removed. Um, concerned that some other more uh, less desirable use of the lot being addressed by this new plan. Unfortunately, not everyone was convinced. 
Now, two well-known Oak Park residents took the lead on a debate over the ballard Holbert uh, development plan. Uh, the residents uh, south of Madison, already benefiting from Holbert's infrastructure improvements, were in favor of the plan and called on Alan J, better known as AJ, Flitcraft, former Oak Park trustee, longtime resident, and landowner from Maple Avenue to voice their support. Another influential Oak Park, uh, Oak Parker, was uh, Charles S. Woodard, shown here um, at the dedication of the whole Oak Park Horse Show Fountain. Uh, he was uh, uh, very much active and head of the committee that uh, built this fountain. Um, and representing, uh, well, concerned that the smaller lot sizes proposed for South of Madison and the smaller homes that might be built on those would diminish the attractiveness of their street. The residents on Home Avenue, north of Madison, opposed the plan and called on longtime Home Avenue resident, Charles Woodard, once again, pictured here, as their representative. Now both Flitcraft and Woodard had a long history of working with each other, agreeing on many matters uh, critical to Oak Park's development. But on this issue, the two longtime friends couldn't find common ground. Now, during an emotionally charged board meeting in November of 1905, Mr. Woodard argued that to maintain the uniformity of the neighborhood, the lots on home should be 75 feet deep and have a frontage of 50 feet. Reserving 16 feet for an alley, this approach would significantly reduce the lot size on the west side of Clinton. Instead of being 150 feet deep, those lots would only be 122 feet. The shallower lots on the west side of Clinton would upset the uniformity of the Hulbert subdivision, be less appealing to buyers, and reduce the return on Hulbert's investment. Mr. Flitcraft argued that Hulbert had already invested over $250,000 in improvements to the subdivision and was moving forward with plans to double that amount. The neighbors south of Madison Street were already realizing the benefits of Mr. Hulbert's development and that those of living north of Madison Street had no right to block it. So it was Mr. Woodard's impassioned argument that swayed the board. At the December 1905 board meeting that followed, uh, the ballard Hulbert uh, proposal was rejected. Disappointed, Hulbert indicated that he might abandon the project, cut his losses, sell his land, and leave the issue to the village to solve at its own expense. Going back to that plan, Ballard, still holding the option to buy the land, made one more grand push to resolve matters with the objecting neighbors. Stressing that alternative uses of the land might be far worse than living with unusual lot sizes, the objecting neighbors came to accept the ballard Holder plan. With neighborhood support, Ballard addressed the board at the February 1906 meeting and overcame the last bit of res uh, resistance. As the Oak Leaves reported at the time, the proposed arrangement of the property, you know, let's see here. Oh. I'm sorry, let's go back. The proposed arrangement of the property was the best that could be made under the circumstances. Ah, here it is. I think I did have it on the side there, that slide. And the argument was settled. Though the plats were approved and the subdivision started, the 35 foot strip lay vacant for years afterward. Um, on this slide, you see by August of 1909, the Hulbert Subdivision Improvement Club demanded more parklands, proposing uh, and they proposed acquiring the strip. Ballard still owned the property and was willing to sell it, but not give it away. If the village wouldn't make the purchase, the residents considered drastic measures that might be taken, including forming a city government of their own or allowing themselves to be annexed by the city of Chicago. 
The saga neared its end when finally in April of 1913, the land had been acquired by developer Henry Hogan's, whose company was starting to build homes on the strip. New style of lots, reads this article. Putting a positive spin on this notorious piece of land, Hogan was quite quoted as saying that the experience with these lots was, has given him and other buildings, builders ideas which might mean a breaking away from the customary narrow and deep lot. So this was an opportunity for growth. Uh, and here's a picture today of the result. Uh, once again, those homes on the east side of Home Avenue now reside on lots that are 75 feet frontage and 47 feet deep. And that is why Home Avenue differs from others in the neighborhood and throughout Oak Park. Now, um, a, a few uh, slides about how I investigated this and uh, gathered this research, especially during uh, the uh, time we've just been through with the pandemic and so on. It was, um, there were so many resources available that for the most part, I did it from the comfort of my own home. So um, next, this slide uh, shows the landing page for the Oak Park Public Library primary source that I went to. Uh, we are so lucky to have this uh, great uh, uh, resource at our fingertips. Um, and uh, looking at this landing page, you can see here, uh, I especially made use of the genealogy and local history page, which shows up here. Now this is a partial view. Um, but this page uh, gives one access, uh, you'll see at the bottom here, uh, to uh, editions of the Chicago Tribune and the historical section that goes 1849 and 1997. But what I tended to use for the most part because I wanted to key in on Oak Park was uh, the link to something called newspaper archive. Um, Entering in, uh, browsing by location, one can narrow this down, uh, look into the United States, to the state of Illinois, to the village of Oak Park, and then entering in names. So for instance, Thomas Hulbert, uh, uh, or Home Avenue, uh, Home Avenue Lots. A number of ideas come up as you, one uh, starts to uh, uh, gain access to certain articles. A key word here, um, the, uh, my, my knowledge of the Flitcraft and Woodard involvement came just from one article that uh, managed to pop up. And then that led me to research those two gentlemen. Um, another great resource that we have here in Oak Park is uh, the uh, Village Hall uh, and the Village website specifically. And you may be familiar with researching your historical Oak Park house. And um, uh, as you go to the village's website, one can drill down through the planning, preservation and zoning uh, tab, historic preservation brochures, etc. And this page uh, will provide some very, uh, very helpful links. Um, the next slide I'm going to show is down here at the bottom, the village of Oak Park historic research sources, the ruskinark.com Oak Park uh, page, which is a survey of homes in Oak Park that um, uh, was done, commissioned by the village uh, in preparation for uh, development of the historic districts. Uh, drilling into this, uh, one can spend quite a bit of time getting in information on specific homes, on neighborhoods, uh, and very helpful. Um, another thing um, that I uh, made use of, is I like to uh, actually start by getting a picture of what did this neighborhood look like? What was the land like? And um, from the Village of Oak Park site, 
one can drill into a link to the Library of Cong Congress and specifically the Sandburn, um, Sandborn insurance maps. There aren't that many of them, but they're really uh, fascinating. They give a picture of uh, the industrial nature of the area um, and how the lots were subdivided. Uh, and this takes you all the way back into the late 1800s um, uh, and helps develop that picture of uh, uh, what was preceding the time period one is researching. I'm gonna pass back up here to another segment of a map and I should have put this in a little earlier, but this was a very helpful map. And I just want a brief story. I have a copy of this map. It is now so dog-eared. Um, I was given it uh, many years ago at a visit to the Oak Park River Forest History Museum located at the Pleasant Home. And I have used that map more times uh, than I can tell you, uh, than I can count. Um, and that map is available right here at the Oak Park History Museum. And uh, it's a great resource. I love pulling that out. It was very helpful with this research. And it's really a lot of fun to pull that out when I, we have visitors from out of town to show them what was and then take them for a walk around this beautiful village and show them what is today. So that uh, is uh, sums up my work on this. And um, I really enjoyed doing that research. And now you know why those lots are different from others in the village. We certainly do. Rachel? So I, I think I'll stay off screen, but I okay. think you all can still hear me. Um, because I want to invite everybody to ask your questions. If you have them, put them in the chat box. Um, I really wanna thank Frank for your presentation today. Um, this question is one that we get very often. So um, if you've asked in the past, hopefully you got your answer today and um, really diving into a lot of these different resources that are available to sort of piece this story together. Um, I want to jump right in with a question that I have and others have asked me directly is um, not directly related to this, but in this area, there was um, a rumor of sorts that there was an intention to put a trolley line on Home Avenue at some point. And I want to ask Frank if you we're finding some information mm -hmm. about that, or do you have an answer to that? Well, the best that I was able to find on that, um, there was um, there was more of a threat, it seemed, than uh, a potential uh, occurrence. Um, now, when I look at this um, research, I, I try to use a little bit of my own deductive uh, uh, powers as well. Right over on Harlem, there was a north-south route uh, of a, a trolley rail line. Um, and then due south and uh, south of Harrison Street was the Metropolitan Elevated Line that was the rumored railroad that would send a spur up this 35-foot strip. The only information I could find about uh, a northbound spur for the Metropolitan Line, though, uh, pertained to uh, their interest in acquiring a strip of land on Kyler. And uh, this would have been Kyler south of uh, Lake Street. And that uh, that was perhaps not pursued uh, to uh, any sort of uh, uh, great length there. But anyway, on this strip, I think there were a lot of rumors, probably started by Mr. Lochran, <laughs> to get people uh, into a mood to uh, get Hulbert back to the uh, bargaining table. Now, um, I see another question here about uh, the 40, uh, was Hulbert's 
45 acre purchase the old golf club. Man, this could be a whole nother program. It, it, it can be uh, because I, I, I believe it, that land served many purposes over the years um, because that old golf club, uh, I, I think it met its end before it moved up to Galewood. Uh, it, it's ended uh, about 1899, if I memory serves me correctly. And so that land was uh, sitting there and um, uh, had been through a, a uses, a number of uses, uh, including baseball fields and uh, nine hole golf course. Um, so anyway, yes, I, I think that's the same area. Perfect. Well, this was good. Um, this was certainly good. Thank you for joining us today, Frank. And thank you all for joining us on the call. And um, I'll just take another minute to say, take a look at our website for more upcoming virtual programs and more upcoming walking tours, which we've been doing around different neighborhoods in Oak Park and River Forest. And um, yeah, so thank you all for your involvement. Send us your questions if you have any that have sparked from this presentation or things that you've been wondering about OPRF history. And I look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you.